Praise the Lord, everybody. Great to be here in the house of the Lord today. You may be seated. Greetings on this first day of spring. We are now entering into another season, entering into another dimension of weather. And good Lord willing, the snow is, is finished and we'll enjoy a little bit of rain and get into April showers and Mayflowers and all of those different things that come with spring and bringing us into summertime. Great place to be in the state of Maine during the summertime. Even with the black flies and the mosquitoes, it will be all right. It's good to be here today. The last few days, been able to be a part of a minister's retreat. Different ministers of the Maine district gathered together in Orono, and we had a great time, challenged by the word of the Lord, and it was a very special moment, I believe. Now, let me read a few verses of Scripture to you here today. 1 Kings 17, 8 through 16. We will not be doing a Sunday school offering uh, in this meeting today. We're saving it for the 11 o'clock service so that we can kick off our Save Our Children fundraising drive for the next uh, four or five weeks. And uh, so just kind of keep that in mind. The Bible says the word of the Lord came unto Elijah, saying, Arise and get thee to Zarephath, and which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a, a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he did. He arose, went to Zarephath, and he came to the gate of the city. Behold, there was a widow woman that was there gathering sticks, and he called to her. He said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called out to her, and she and he said, now bring me a morsel of bread also. And she said, as the Lord thy God liveth, I don't have a cake. I don't have any bread. All I have is a handful of meal and a barrel, a little oil and a cruise. I'm gathering two sticks that I might go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. And, the, and Elijah said unto her, fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first. Bring it unto me, and and afterwards make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord, the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, Neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. She went and did as Elijah had said, and the rest is a miracle. I am thankful today for the promises of God that have come to us. and We have a faith and trust in God, and you can have an assurance that God will take care of you. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 16 letting us know that we have a high priest which can be touched. He can be accessed. And then it says, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I want to talk to us for just a few minutes here today on this thought, help in hard times. Help in hard times. Jesus, we thank you for your kindness to us today. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to hear your word, and I pray that you'd touch our hearts. God, you'd encourage us and challenge us at the same time. Help us, Lord, to draw closer to you than we've ever been before. In Jesus' name, amen. I suppose you're already hearing that loud hum that's going on. Hopefully it's not by my own doing. You've probably heard it said as parents have looked at their young people or their children and they've said things like, don't go out and do such and such because such and such will happen if you do. And they say, oh, Ma, come on. That's not going to happen. That, that's not going to take place. It's just, you know, you're, 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 you're getting a little worried. You're over anxious and overprotective and all of that. Many times we will hear the preacher preach 
And he'll begin to speak about different things that's going to occur here on the face of the earth. And in the back of your mind, you're saying, come on now. Really? That's, that's not going to happen. And as I begin to think about this, and as I believe the Lord was dealing with my mind and heart throughout the night, and I felt an urgency. I, I stand here today, I'm alarmed, I'm, I'm very alarmed of the things that, that I am seeing. I mean, as, as we go back over the past few years and we stay with this thought that's not going to happen or that will never take place, who would have thought, who would have thought that our, our world would have basically shut down? I mean, who would have thought that would happen? If, if I'd have been mentioning that and, and telling you that prior to COVID, you'd have been saying, Pastor, you're losing it. And that's just not going to happen. But it, it happened, and it is happening, and uh, these things are taking place. Who would have thought that uh, we would be living in a day where that there would be a country that is being basically destroyed, uh, young and old, children, women, indiscriminately bombed, missiled, destroyed, trying to escape the, the havoc, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if it's a school building, doesn't matter if it's a hospital, it's just to destroy those people. Who would have thought that we would hear the utterings from a world leader that would speak of cleansing and, uh, uh, you know, just exterminating and, and things and, and making our uh, world population better by exterminating a, another group of people. You say, Pastor, you're, you're telling me that's, that's happened. I'm telling you it, it's happened recently and it is happening. Uh, the, the, the thoughts of what Adolf Hitler did in, in the World War II era and the extermination of Jews and ethnic cleansing and all of that is happening right now in our world in Ukraine. This is happening. But who would have thought that, that this would happen? Who would have thought that some of the most powerful and the most powerful country, nation in the world would stand pretty much idly by knowing that these things are happening and allow them to happen. Who would have thought? Who would have thought that, that we uh, wouldn't do anything because, and, and this, some of this is just my opinion, may not be a, your opinion, but let me just express myself here today. Who would have thought that um, we would be in, in the place where that Hypersonic weapons are being used against these people, capable of carrying nuclear weapons. Who would have thought that we'd be in a position that we are in today? I really wonder today how close we are to a nuclear exchange. And I'm not even trying to scare you or, or whatever here today. I'm looking at what I feel as a reality as to what is going on. I'm, I'm hearing of all of the uh, nuclear arsenal of, of Russia being on its highest alert, which means that all of ours are too, but you just didn't hear about it. How close are we to that? I'll call it an encounter where that one-third of the Earth's population will be exterminated, will be killed, according to the Scripture. I've wondered in times past as to how that was, would happen. And I could see where that if there were a great pandemic that would go around the world, I, I, I suppose that would be very capable of, of killing one-third of the world's population. Beyond that, I, I guess if it was a long, drawn-out conventional war, I suppose... It would take some time, but nearly impossible for such 
extermination to take place or loss of life. But if they start exchanging nuclear weapons, we will see one-third of the world's population to be destroyed. And you say, Pastor, why are you saying the I'm seeing these things happening around me, and it's in the Bible. And so I know it's going to happen sometime, somehow, someplace. Now, I'm hoping and I'm praying that we are not here as the church at that time. I'm hoping that, that we are raptured. That's, that's the part of me that says I don't want to have anything to do with that. But as we approach these times, these events, and see how close something like that could truly happen, if we do believe that we're not going to be here when such an event occurs, how on top of our game ought we to be here today by what we are seeing happening in our world right now. I don't know what your opinion may be of the leaders of our, our nations in the world, but in my opinion, some of them are not too stable. In my opinion, there's a spirit upon them, and they are at the very edge of launching that kind of a warfare. And I just wanted to kind of say that simply because in the night I'm, I'm waking and flags are flying in my mind and I'm thinking, God, where are we? And, and uh, where are the, the people of the church? And I was reminded of a message that an old preacher preached during our, our retreat, a man by the name of J.T. Pugh, he was famous for the the message that was the, I believe it was the title of it was Your First Night in Hell. Is that what it was, Brother Kennedy? And uh, he went on to uh, preach to young and old about the danger, of course, of, of going to a place like hell. But one of the lines that, uh, that he shared with those people was this. He said, today I'm preaching to somebody that's going to hell. Today, I'm talking to someone that is going to be lost. Today, I'm talking to someone that's going to lose out with God. And so here we are today, and those words are going through my mind, and I'm thinking, God, how many times have I come to church and preached to someone that was going to hell, that was going to be lost? Uh, that was going to be separated from the Lord, not just for a few days, but forever. How many people have I taught and preached to about being born again and the importance of being baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, and obviously repent of your sins, and then living a life pleasing to the Lord? I, I'm, I'm just kind of reiterating some of this stuff, and, and really a lot, of, a lot of this is not right in my notes here today. But there's an urgency and, and there's an alarm in, in my heart that's wanting to sound out to everyone that's here. And I, I wish that, that everyone in our church was in this service today, right now. But uh, there, there is this danger of, of us being lost. Paul spoke about it. And he said, I've preached to others, and am I going to become a castaway? Am I going to be lost? And so we look around this room today, and I, I think about it in its present tense, I guess, and where we're at right now. And I, I look around and I say, no, I don't think so. I don't think I'm preaching to anyone that's going to be lost. But then I look back over my years of preaching and teaching, and I know that I did. I, I did. I, I, well, by all indications that individuals I've spoken to, preached to, emptied my heart out to, tried to save by teaching and patience and trying to teach them and, and help them and pull them out of the flames by, by just coaxing them out. And then there's been others I've been a little more forceful with, I suppose, and told them, you really need to stop what you're doing and live for God. And got a little bit more, more forceful. See, we, we do speak in love, but sometimes love causes us 
to, to get a little bit more emotional about what's going on than just simply saying, well, you know, son, you, 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 really, you really shouldn't be out there in the street. Uh, you really shouldn't be doing that. But you get a hold of them and you grab them and you pull them into a place of safety because of the love that you have for them. And Jesus, the Bible, Jesus teaches us that, that we have to reach for those people. Some you'll save with compassion and others you're going to save as pulling them out of the fire. And so in my spirit, I am alarmed today for all the things that I'm seeing and what is taking place and, and, and all of the conditions of our world. Who would have thought? Who would have thought that they would be arming uh, children, basically children, to shoot weapons? I mean, who would have thought that, that uh, you know, 13, 14-year-old boys would be trained in how to fight and to defend their, their homes and defend their, their city. Uh, who would have thought that aged men, like all of us that are here today, whatever age you may be, there'd not be one of us that would be left to just say, okay, you can go and you'll, you'll be, a, no, we want all of you to stay. If you're a man, we want you to stay, take up arms and fight for this homeland. James and Julie, you'd be parting ways. You'd be looking at each other and saying, hey, I'm, I'm hoping I'm going to be okay. You know, I hope things are going to be all right. Who would have thought we'd be in a day that it would be doing something like this? But it's happening in our world right now. And, and I feel such an urgency in, in my spirit because of these things that are happening and the danger of us missing where we're at so that we don't make adjustments in what we're doing and how we're living that when Jesus comes back, he'll take us to be with him. I, I, I want to just you know, share a couple of things here today that if we're not careful, we'll allow some things to come into our hearts that will cause us to miss out with God. Maybe not immediately but there are things that lead to to other things that take us away or that we we lean towards things that uh, you know would would cause us to, to be destroyed and I would be preaching to somebody here today that would spend eternity in hell if you were to stay on the road or you were to go to the direction of that kind of a spirit or that kind of uh, activity um, when we uh, do not have the appreciation for the, the Word of God and what it is and, and, and the, the truth of the Word of God, when there is not a, a heartfelt conviction in us that the Word of God is forever settled and it is true and we must live by it. You realize that in our world there are a lot of different doctrines. Now, there is a doctrine that basically will tell you that you don't have to be born again. You don't have to repent. You don't have to be baptized in Jesus' name. You don't have to be filled with the, the Holy Ghost. It, it's, it's been referred to as a lesser light doctrine. It's a, it's a doctrine of, well, if you don't know, then you're better off not knowing because there will be a group of people that will be allowed to uh, kind of just be a, you know, I, I kind of look at it, maybe it's a little bit... Uh, uh, maybe it's inappropriate to say, but it's almost like they, they can be the slaves for, the, for God's people or something in the future, uh, servants and things of that nature. But it's being taught, being taught to people that you, 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 if, if you're not born again, when Jesus said you're not going to enter into the kingdom of God, he really didn't, he, what he was meaning was that you weren't going to be in the bride of Christ, but you could just be in the wedding party, Okay. I mean, you know, you, you may not be the bride, but you could just be part of the festivities. And you could be setting the tables, and you could be, you know, doing all those kind of things. And you say, Pastor, is that really true? Is that really what's happening? Am, am I pretty accurate, Brother Kennedy, about some of these things? That's, and, and that's just, just one. It's, it's making people believe that there's some other way to be saved. And I'm here to stand on the Word of God today, and, and it doesn't matter to me who it might be from the... Top dog to the, the lowest, every man must be born again of the water and of the Spirit. Or you will not enter into the kingdom of God. 
Born of the water is baptism, and baptism is in Jesus' name for the remission of sins. And you must be born of the Spirit, which is, of course, receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and it is evidenced by speaking in other tongues. There is no other way, and I'll stand firmly upon that to the day I die. There is no other way, Brother Chris. And though we would look at individuals that are good people, we see them. We, we may even have some of them in our own families that are good people. And we, we would, it's hard to wrap our, our head around the fact that they're lost, and which many times would kind of hinder us from sharing the gospel with them because we're thinking, well, you know, that, that Uncle Joe, he's a pretty good guy. I, mean, I can't imagine it, that he's going to go to hell and be lost forever. You know, and, and Joe's kind of hard to talk to, and Joe's my uncle, and all these different things. We have neighbors. We have neighbors that we wave to and, and all of that that we see out there every day that are going to hell, and they are going to be lost forever, and it's for an eternity. And, um, you know, we may not, uh, you know, feel like that we're evangelists, and we may not feel like that we are, you know, great preachers or teachers or any of those types of things, but we are neighbors, and uh, we need to share uh, the Word of God and the saving message of Jesus Christ. We are living in a time that I believe we are close to the coming of the Lord, and we need to reach as many as we possibly can. Parents need to be so vigil of what is going on in their young people's lives need to understand what is taking place, where they're at as they're growing up, and the things that are there to destroy them. It doesn't take many unchaperoned events for a young person to become an alcoholic, to become a drug addict, to be involved in promiscuity. It doesn't take too many of those. And you say, oh, pastor... That's not going to happen. That's not going to take place. It doesn't take, it doesn't take many uh, events that could, could, could be going on in a young person's life that's a part of our church that would cause that child, that young person, to give up and start being involved in some things that would affect their life forever. Some of those things would be like, uh, you know, just a group of boys hanging out. And, and one of the guys says to, to, to you, if you're a part of that group, hey, Chris, take a look at this. Take a look at this. And all of a sudden, an image is burned into your mind. A pornographic image is burned right into that mind of yours that you'll remember from that day to the day you die. It'll just be etched in there. And men and women become addicted to such things through events just like that. You say, oh, pastor, that's not going to happen. That's not going to take place. Oh, if you just experiment with this, just a, you know, just a little drink. Maybe you're sitting on Pappy's lap and Pappy's an al alcoholic and Pappy drank beer ever since you've known Pappy. Pappy says, here, boy, take a little drink of this, see how you like it. You say, oh, pastor, those things are not going to happen. Oh, how about just a, I mean, it's, you might as well try it. It's just a cigarette. It's, it's, just, it's just that. But that's all it takes for that young person to all of a sudden begin a journey of 40 or 50 years smoking a couple, two or three packs a day. And you say, pastor, oh, that's not going to happen. But the truth is, it has happened over and over and over and over and over and over again. Time after time after time after time. Things that will never change in a young person's life as they give of themselves to activities that uh, kind of let the guard down. There are certain things that I believe as a as a parent and as a, as a pastor that we ought to avoid. There are things that we ought to, to stay away from. There are things that, and activities, Lot, Lot, he, he broke up with Abraham because there was a conflict going on in the, in the herd and, and uh, 
He didn't go right to Sodom. He just kind of leaned that way for a while. And when we tend to lean in a certain direction, we tend to move in that direction. If you kind of lean to the right and you make any motion at all, most likely that's the direction you're going to end up going. And Lot was leaning towards Sodom. And Sodom, obviously a very wicked place. We, we cannot, and, and like I say, there, there's such a, a heaviness and a burden upon my heart about what's, what's happening uh, in our world and, and, and uh, the influences that there are upon our young people. Uh, they fly their gay pride flag in, in the lunchroom of the school. Well, wait a minute now. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Can I put a Christian flag in that school? Can I, and I wave that in the, in the hallway and in the lunchroom. Can I put that up? And they'll put their commercials on the TV and they'll have the two guys kissing and they'll have the two girls kissing and, and all of that kind of stuff. And they're trying to, to indoctrinate. They're trying to, to put into the minds of our young people, the young people of our church, the young people of our area, trying their very best to make them feel like that that kind of a lifestyle is all right. And behind that lifestyle is such a spirit. And such an addiction. M sexual addiction is a hard one to break, whether it's on the side of uh, homosexuality and lesbianism, as it would be with adultery and fornication. It, it gets into an individual, and before you know it, they have a very, very difficult time in coming out of it. Now, I'm just saying this, not that it's an impossibility for individuals to be able to be delivered from such a thing obviously it can and the blood of Christ can do this and, and experience with God but there are things that become very difficult to get rid of in a person's life you say oh pastor that's, that's not going to happen and that's not the way it is but in experience that's what I've seen that's what I've seen, and that's what I've experienced. And so when, when, we, when we teach and, and when we encourage, don't, don't, let those, don't, don't let those kids go out on a date by themselves. That's where, where things are, are happening that, that you're not going to want to take place, things that could change the lives of those young people for the rest of their life. What are you going to do when that child becomes pregnant? What are you going to do? Because now not only do you have two young people that are in sin, but you have um, them as parents. Oh, well, we'll just get rid of the child. We'll become murderers now, and uh, we'll just take care of it that way. One thing leads to another, and we've got to be very, very careful. I think, you're, I think you're hearing what I'm saying. I think you're hearing what I'm putting down here today. And I am, I am very, very uh, concerned about what is happening in our world and what is taking place. This is no time for us to let up on our relationship with the Lord. When outward holiness begins to slip, when we decide that we want to look like the world and we want to act like the world, you say, Pastor, you're so concerned with the outward holiness. Give us a break, would you? And truly, this pastor here, um, I don't preach the clothesline very often at all. But I do teach you to be holy because he is holy. And when I see the outward holiness begin to slip, I know that the inward holiness is slipping. Now, I can't see on the inside, but I can see on the outside. And in our world today, the, the dress is for seduction, as it's been for quite some time. As it is in our world today is the blending of the sexes. It is that which pertains to a man on a woman and that which pertains to a woman on a man. I do feel today you'd be quite alarmed if I was wearing a dress. That's right. Remember that there's such a blending of, of the, the sexes in our world today. Um, 
I might as well go on record to say it's a, it's a travesty as to what's happening in our world when it becomes that men are competing uh, as women and, and such. And, and uh, it's, it just shows you what direction our, our world is going in and, uh, and all of that. Um, when, when outward holiness begins to slip, when we want to look like the world, I don't believe that Jesus had long hair. I don't believe Jesus had long hair. You say, did he have a beard? I believe he had a beard because they plucked the beard out. But I don't believe he had long hair. Why do you say that, Pastor? Because the Bible teaches it's a shame for a, a man to have long hair. He's certainly not going to have long hair if he's teaching in the scriptures, pointing out to us that uh, it's a shame for a man to have long hair I'm trying to define and put it all together as to what's long and what's short I can make it simple for you long is uncut and short is cut and I'm not here even today to teach a study on that I just want to kind of bring us into focus here a little bit as to, to what is happening in our world and what is taking place and how that we need to be aware and how, of how close that we are to the coming of the Lord and the beginning of a period of time, if we want to call it time, where that there is no end. There is absolutely no end. When our, when our giving becomes sporadic, when we begin to excuse ourselves from our responsibility as being a part of the family of God and the kingdom of God in our giving, and you say, well, Pastor, I'm not so sure that God is concerned about what I give. But He is. He is. He wants to bless you, first of all. And He can't bless what He can't bless. But He will bless what He can bless. And if you will honor God with your first fruits, the first fruit of your increase, then God will bless you for that commitment. He'll be committed to you as you are committed to Him. And I'm teaching to the choir uh, with many of you here today on this subject because you give so sacrificially and you give as unto the Lord in, in such a, a wonderful fashion. And I'm, I, I guess I, I, I don't know if I should be, but I'm very impressed by what you do when it comes time to give to the work of the Lord. But uh, if that becomes sporadic and and we begin to excuse ourselves and think, oh, well, I guess it doesn't really matter. I mean, you know, the, 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 you know I didn't lose all of my money because I, you know, I, I, I didn't uh, honor God with my first fruits. I, I, I got by this week or that week or that month or whatever it is. And, and whew, you know, I got by with that one. Um, you, you know, it, it doesn't happen that way many times in much the same way that when Adam and Eve were in the garden, it didn't happen immediately as soon as they partook of the fruit that they died. But there was a process that began in their life that continued on to the day that they died and death came into the world that uh, it was something that was a great impact upon humanity. And so when our giving becomes sporadic, when our attendance to church and, and staying out of church and, and in fellowship with the saints of God becomes so sporadic and, and it becomes, um, you know, just very optional in, in, in what we're thinking. And uh, I, I'm not expecting uh, you to, uh, uh, y you know, be here at every single service. It'd be great if you were. I understand that things happen in life, and I, I just want it to be a, a priority, a top priority in your life, where that you know that they, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship, and there's nothing like getting together with God's people. I've been healed a number of times. I've received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I've been baptized in Jesus' name. I've been encouraged over and over and over and over again in my life by being in church. I didn't get it by watching something on video or TV or something like that. I didn't get it, to, you know, by just kind of listening to a tape in a tape deck or something or a CD in a CD or uh, whatever, wherever we're at uh, now. I mean, those things are all good. I, I'm not trying to take away from them. But there's nothing like getting together with the people of God. 
There's nothing like getting together with the people of God. I want above anything and everything in your life and in my life to be that we are ready to meet the Lord. The good doctor had been a help for many, many people down through the years. The young had been benefited from his medical knowledge. Here we go. The aged had been blessed by his tender care. He was the small town doctor that would deliver babies. He would cast a broken arm. He would even give you a shot of penicillin when you needed it to take care of that infection that you had. He helped many, many people over the years while he stayed there in that one practice for probably 30, 35 years. Many people came to him. Many people were treated. Many of them, their lives extended by the help that this one man could give. But the day came when the good doctor needed some help himself. The pain in his chest was, well, that's just about of, just about of indigestion. You, you know, it's something a little antacid would take care of. And the pain in his shoulder was, oh, that was just an old baseball injury. And the shortness of breath was, well, he, he was carrying a few extra pounds now. It wasn't anything to worry about. But the good doctor basically cut his life short because when all of the signs pointed that, that he needed some help, he didn't get it. He didn't take advantage of it. He obviously would have some connections, I'm sure. Certainly had a doctor for himself. But all of the signs that he got, he just kind of discounted. That's, that's not a heart issue. That's not a heart attack. And he failed to get help. What, while all the time he gave help and he helped, he failed to get help of his own. Would you stand with me today? The last 37 minutes that I've been talking to you today is about us getting the help that we need. We must all be ready to meet the Lord. If you will just humor me today, and over the next few moments when we begin to sing, I'd like to, for you to consider, are you ready to meet the Lord? If your life was to end today, and someday it will, mine and yours, it will not matter the house I live in, the car I drive, the cost of clothes, the hairstyle, will not matter the color of my skin. But what will matter is, are you living for God? Have you been faithful to the call of God upon your life? The question rises up in my mind, are you ready? Are you ready? And I'm not here today to condemn you. I just want you to consider the question and respond appropriately to that question. And really, truthfully, only you can answer it. The song today, I'd just like us to sing it, think about the words of it. And maybe we could just take a few minutes before we decide to call it a Sunday school class. If we've got something to get underneath the blood of Jesus, let's get it there. If there's some, some feeling of 
bitterness against a brother, if there's a commitment you've let go of, a vow that you've made to God, you know what it may be. God will bring it to your mind, I believe. Can we get that taken care of and can we be ready to meet the Lord? Let's go ahead and sing and let's praise and worship. Life was filled with guns and war. Everyone got trampled on the of bread to buy a bag of gold. I wish we'd all been ready. There's no time to change your mind. The sun has come and you've been left. turns her head, he's gone. I wish we'd all been ready. Two men walking up a hill, one disappears and one's left standing still. The sun has come, and you've been left Lord, help us today. Cleanse us, Lord, I pray. There's no time to change your mind. The sun has come, and you've been left 